So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending this panel together. And yes, we're about to try to deep dive into the skills your children should know uh, to survive in the near future and in the digital society and economy that we are all trying to build together. So, I mean, you might have been told a lot about Uber Uberization, automatization, robotization, and all the super techy buzzwords um, actually um, are predicting us that 30 to 50% of the job, as we know, will be gone by uh, 2030. It's a fact, but we're going to try to see the bright side of it for the next uh, 32 minutes indeed, and try to learn about the skills we're going to need to survive the fourth industrial revolution. So I have a very first question to you, and it's really open to all members of the panel so that we can actually have a broader view of what is your part in this edtech ecosystem? Um, how would you define education today? Is it still an empowerment tool? Is it more about learning? Is it more about skills? What would be your thoughts, Sabine? Um, thank you for the question. I think it actually opens up the floor very nicely. And to me, education and learning is like always um, creating and shaping of the future. That has always been that, and it will. I think. The only difference that we see nowadays is the past that information and technology is evolving. So I think it's even more important nowadays to give a good skill set for our kids, for them to have actually the ability and the creativity and the, the willingness to learn all the way, so all the way long. I think this is very important nowadays. It's not, not so much about technology, it's about actually the idea and the love for learning. Um, Martin, actually, at the EPFL, would you consider skills over knowledge? So I think things haven't changed as much uh -huh. as um, that we think, because in the end, it's the ability to learn how to learn, which uh -huh. will be most, you know. So I, I'm a little bit critical of learning skills, because uh, you end up teaching kids uh, how to use Excel sheets, <laughs> which is you know, <laughs> about as useless as uh, in 30 years as we, we can guess. Instead, at EPFL, we have decided that one skill that we are not yet teaching, but that is fundamental, at least in higher education, is something we call computational thinking, uh -huh. which is not programming, please note. It's mm -hmm. something very different. It's about posing problems and solving problems, understanding that computation will be involved, and computation is a very broad sense of solving problems. So actually, um, how do we learn how to learn at the University of Sydney, Michael? So we're a very large institution. We have about uh -huh. 67,000 students. Um, and we've just thought very hard about what it is that our undergraduates will need in order to be the people who tell the machines what uh -huh. to do, not the people whose jobs are replaced by the machines. Uh -huh. And there are really four things. Um, the first is you still need a discipline. All the literature in our experience shows that in order to acquire the kind of critical thinking skills and skills in effective oral and written communication that Martin is talking about, um, you need a, a deep understanding of a discipline. Mm -hmm. But you'll also need a capacity to stand outside your discipline. Um, and so we're making it possible for students to take a second major from anywhere in the university and also having certain breadth requirements like computational thinking. Um, you'll need an international perspective. So. Um, uh, we are focusing very much on the acquisition of second languages and cultural competence and mobility experiences. But finally, and this is the real, um, the real capstone, you need an ability to work in a team with people from other disciplines, bringing those skills together on a real world problem. Uh -huh. And we're making an extended experience like that a part of the experience of every undergraduate, working with a company or with a civil society organization as a team um, of academics and students working on real problems. And that, that core of depth and breadth and application, we think is going to be crucial um, you know, and will certainly survive the machine age. Great perspective. And we'll go back to the specific skills we need in a few seconds. But first, Tibor, how crucial is education when it comes to the European Commission? It is very important because for me, education is a kind of support for personality development. We are sometimes blinded by technological development, but, uh -huh. uh, but uh, the, the essence, the core remains the same, and that's the personality. 
And that's why uh, it is very important for the European Commission. If we, if we want uh, uh, cohesive societies in the future, if we want a cohesive Europe in the future of tomorrow, we have to invest in education and we have to put the emphasis on, on education as a personality development. Mm. Education is definitely an investment. But remember that in this discussion, we're trying to leave no one behind in the future we are going to live in. So um, we were discussing skills above learning. And I, I'm, I'm just wondering, can skills-based education help solve the inequality puzzle? Martin, maybe. So it's interesting that you, the title of the panel is No One Left Behind because the United States had a program which was called No Child Left Behind, 2001. And then 15 years later, they changed the name into All Students Succeed. Please note the marketing spin. Uh, so I think it's not so much about leaving people behind, but giving everybody, everybody, the tools so they can succeed. And this means this is not just university education that's at all levels, but it's also continuing education. Yeah. So for example, at TPFL, we are developing a program for digital skills that is available online for anybody with any background. And I think this is very important. It's, some, it's an experiment. It's not our core business, but we think it's exactly important for the cohesion of societies that you're pointing out. So how can we make sure that educational institution actually left no one behind? Michael. So the important thing is that the various parts of the system work effectively together uh -huh. um, and worked with a common set of goals. And those goals have to be to give people the skills to um, live, a, um, live a rewarding life, mm -hmm. um, to, to, to be able to participate in the workforce. And they're, they're core critical thinking skills. It's going to be more important in the future than ever uh -huh. for everybody to be able to ask the right sorts of questions in this great flood of information that they're getting. And you know, recent elections have shown that it really matters whether or not people right across the community have those skills. And that's why, why I think education is always going to be critical. Thibault? Yeah, let, let me roll back from the, from the social end or the uh -huh. social goal of the education. And that's... Uh, um, creating responsible citizens of a democratic society who are able to pursue autonomous life. And if we take this perspective, uh, I think horizontal skills are very important in education, life skills or soft skills, to, to, to work in a team, to, to live together peacefully with, with other individuals, to, to build up a community, to to establish a personal network, uh, to reach your own goals with peaceful means. I think those are the really important fundamentals of an education system. And we can build uh, technological skills and, and other specific skills uh, on the basis of, of those horizontal or, or, or soft skills. And that's why even if technology changes modalities of delivery, so that we do, for example, in relation to students in disadvantaged communities, use much more effective targeted methods of technological delivery, mm -hmm. having communities of learning like schools and universities is always going to be important because that's where you get that sort of face-to-face -face interaction that teaches you those soft skills. Speaking of technology, let's turn to the tech giant <laughs> on the panel. Actually, Sabine, how tech giant can have an impact on this brand new way to uh, figure out that education needs to be actually brought to everyone on Earth? I actually would like to build on what Michael was saying uh -huh. because I believe that technology can actually open up and free up space uh, for the one-to-one -one of tutoring between kids and tutors. Uh, so you have both. You have the technology who helps you for a very um, dedicated, individualized learning program that is very helpful. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it gives you time and space for this human interaction, which is always, I think we all know this, it's always so important to have somebody to look um, up to, to like be your mentor. So it's not all about technology, but technology can help and foster all of this. And also I think we have 
long believed in the promise of technology to actually change a lot of things, and it can if we use it uh, like correctly. We have to be very careful and look out for how to we um, distribute technology, because if we don't distribute it equally, it actually um, increases the dis disadvantage in some areas. So I think it's important for societies as well as tech companies uh -huh. to look for programs to actually help societies, governments to spread out technology as equally as possible. But I think all in all, technology and human interaction will and need to come together all along. Yeah, but actually, if, if we do consider education as a market and an investment, how can we make sure, again, that inequality wouldn't actually be part of the problem? Because when you're creating a market, you're creating demand and the other part of it. So how can we make sure, again, that no one is left behind? So <laughs> Martin. Yeah, let me point out something extremely important because the debate on online education has been driven very much so by the Anglo-Saxon view of the uh -huh. world. If I look at Europe, one of the benefits of Europe is that we have essentially free, high-quality public education at all levels, including universities. So the people that leave EPFL with, I think, a degree that is quite worthwhile have actually paid essentially nothing to get it except hard work. And this is a model that I think is all inclusive. It gives equal chances to all segments of the population. And it's one of the great things of Europe that we should not let go. And so I think we'd say, um, <laughs> so we have a, um, a system of income contingent loans to support higher education. And I think we'd say that there are other ways of directing resource to different parts of the higher education system um, and balancing the cost of education and research against other public priorities is obviously going to be a crucial uh -huh. issue for governments going sure. forward. And how would actually institution and government can answer the question? Exactly, exactly. I, I agree. I think education is partly a, a public good. Uh -huh. So there is, a, there is a strong public interest of a society to keep its population at a relatively good quality education. I mean, uh, it's, it's not only a... Um, 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 a question of civilization, but it's also a question of competitiveness. It's a background information and a, and a background supporting element mm -hmm. of the cohesion of a society, a well-being of a society. Sure. So it's a public good. But on the other hand, of course, uh, for the sake of competitiveness, there might be parts of, of the education where market principles or, uh, or, com or the principles of, of competition can enter, but it uh, must not harm the fundamental functioning of the education system as a public good. Quick follow-up with Sabine, and then we'll throw the next question. Yeah, I think we have been speaking a lot about like education for kids and also universities, but I think one thing to keep in mind is that jobs change so rapidly that we have to think also about how we um, reskill the current and also future workforces. And this is something where universities governments and also companies can and need to come together. So we have a large program working a lot with governments. It's called mm -hmm. Growth Engines, where we have trained uh, about one million Europeans just in this year to equip them with the tools and skills they actually need today. And another thing I think is that since work changes so much and we will see different jobs sets, it's important to have the basic skills um, developed and quick early on and then keep it throughout life. So these, yeah. to me, are something to, n to need and reconsider. That's, that's, ex that's yeah. exactly right. And the important <laughs> point, I mean, in this conversation, we've both talked about the continuum of learning and how it will go forever <laughs> throughout your life and the importance technology has to play in making learning available at different points. Uh -huh. But we've also talked about the importance of moments of participation in communities of learning that schools and education uh, at schools and universities will also have a role uh -huh. and I think the challenge for a modern university is how does it reach backwards into the school system and we're doing a lot teaching coding through gaming in exactly. primary schools for example particularly in disadvantaged areas uh -huh. and how does it reach forward into lifelong learning so that you both um, retain the sense of community, particularly for people in that 18 to 25 bracket, 
but also are working across the lifelong learning spectrum. And technology is central there to what universities do. Absolutely, but still, I mean, when, when, let me throw a fact and figure here. 65% uh, of kindergartners will grow up to have jobs that currently do not exist. I mean, it's kind of a crucible question for any stakeholder on, in the tech community, either pure tech or educational institution, either governments or high tech giants again. How can you actually foresee the jobs of tomorrow and try to prepare actual kids to be the workers of the future? But my, my problem is that jobs traditionally defined by professions. Uh -huh. And probably in the future, we're not going to have jobs in, in, mm -hmm. in its classical meanings, but, but posts or responsibilities or, or, uh, or knots uh -huh. or, or something like that. Because uh, as we can see in a, in a cutting edge company, uh, sometimes people are not not defined by their own jobs, but their own responsibilities or their own posts. And, and it can change time to time. So probably education has to follow this development. We have to make uh, educational systems more flexible. Mm -hmm. When we talk about education, we, we are concentrating exclusively on institutions, schools, universities, uh -huh. kindergartens. But there's the lifelong learning, uh, different platforms for for lifelong learning, and there are areas of informal and non-formal education. For instance, for me, uh, in the European Commission, uh, in tackling radicalization of, of young people, grassroots sports organizations, which gives the, the feeling of community, which gives the experience of, of, uh, of being in friendship with others without knowing the language, can be very um, important. So probably we have to broaden our mm -hmm. scope sure. to other, other areas, and uh, that could be the explanation for, future, for the future job market or, or responsibility markets. We have, to, we have to help young people to develop their competencies, mm -hmm. their responsibilities, their, their soft skills. Yeah, but uh, actually, gentlemen, do we have to huh, think about education on startup mode to push the boundaries of education? So, um, uh, education has never been about preparing you for a job. Uh -huh. um, and we have already know that there have been such huge changes in the la labour market over the last 50 years, let alone the next 50 years, that anyone that was trained with a very particular set of skills was, had those skills very quickly out of date. But people who were taught to think, people who were taught to communicate, people who were taught how to see the world through the eyes of the other, people who were taught how to work in teams. These are the kinds of skills that will survive whatever the workforce profile looks like. And one thing we know about technological revolutions is every technological revolution has come with the prophecy that we would not be employed, that we would all be sitting around with enormous amounts of leisure time. And every technological revolution has created more work for human beings, just new kinds of jobs. But new kinds of jobs that require those same intellectual and interpersonal skills that um, we think universities and schools um, really need to focus on. Interesting. Martin? Yeah, I think what's interesting is that uh, one should look at what sort of skills and jobs mm -hmm. are at risk, and that sort of defines the complementary set of things we should really teach. And this is about creativity, about independent thinking, about critical thinking, about social skills, about the theory of mind, of being able to see the world through the eyes of others. This makes it actually much more interesting than, than teaching some narrow skills that will be outdated in less than a generation. And yet the irony is <laughs> that all the literature says um, and all the experience shows that to to learn those general skills, uh -huh. you do actually need to focus on a particular body of knowledge, a particular body of human understanding. And that's, that's why we think there is a role for the core disciplines and for mastery of the core disciplines alongside a broader curriculum. Sabine. But um, what you mentioned, I think, especially speaks to um, that we need to have a layer across basically all lessons and all curriculum to have a change of 
um, how kids work and interact with the tutors, how they work in, in groups, on projects, because exactly this kind of interaction helps them to learn the skills they need. And I think we all mention the same kind of skill sets kids will need in the future. Collaboration, critical thinking, creative thinking, and working towards a goal, a project. And um, all the projects I have actually done, and we, have to, we do a lot and work a lot also with kids on um, coding projects, mm -hmm. because in coding projects, as you mentioned on computer uh, gaming projects, you immediately see the results. And this helps not only kids to see that within minutes they can change and be the actor of an internet and not just be the consumer, but be the actor and shaping the world, but you see actually the sparkle in their eyes. They're so proud mm -hmm. and they can actually do things they've never been able to do before. Speaking publicly, for example, I've seen kids being so shy before, but they spoke publicly and presented their project. So by training them to code and coding nowadays is not like this old school coding very dumb and dull but very creative um, you have an entertaining way of doing this actually have this underlying capability for them to learn the others we call it soft skills but really i mean is it just soft skills is what will define um, how they will be successful in the future, not only in their person, not only in their professional life, but also in their personal life. And but the challenge for yeah, educational, yeah. sorry, the challenge for educational ahead. institutions in that is in some of the mechanics of it. So, for example, collaboration is incredibly important. But everybody who's involved in education knows that students hate group work, and the reason that they hate group work is because they all want their own mark, their own uh -huh. grade and they don't want to be tied down to the grade of somebody or other else. So actually to get this right, you're right, really requires challenging thinking in uh -huh. institutions like Martin's and mine. Mm -hmm. How do we change not just what we do, but some of the basic assumptions about the value of what we do in our practice? Actually, I would really like to follow up with Martin on this question of coding, because we were discussing this prior to you know, stepping up on stage and many think that coding is the language of the future, that children need to go on moral literacy about codings, that they will have a say in the near future to understand how technology is made, but also to have a power on techno upon technology. But do we really need several billion developers? Probably not. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think Google consumes a number of them, but we don't need, I mean, it's like writing and reading and writing. You don't need 7 billion authors of novels. Um, I think what it points out is that because a lot of things, we discussed a lot of the quantitative things, programming and so on, but what's left, not behind, but what's center stage is actually questions of humanities. It's questions of ethics. It's questions of policy. What do we really want the robots to do? What, you know, what sort of framework do we give and so on? And this points out that even in technological universities, institutes of technology, the teaching of the humanities will actually become much more important than it is now. Sabine. So we probably will not trillion of people <laughs> as programmers, even though I think what is totally underestimated is that coding is not there and not just needed by companies, but if you work for a social business, if you work um, in any, any other area, actually you need coders and you need programming. So we shouldn't underestimate like, the need for people being actually trained and well-skilled in that area. And it will be in the future one of the best paid jobs. I think this is also something that might motivate a lot of people to do this. But give me like just this one tiny example. We know that about 74% of middle grade girls and young uh, ladies actually are interested in STEM subjects. So quite a high number and percentage. By the time they come to high school, only 0.4% of this actually are interested in mastering into one of these subjects. So the question is, what happened in between? And isn't this something we actually need to overcome? And how are the matters to overcome this? Because obviously, we have a disadvantage for girls uh, mastering in these areas. Especially, we also know from a lot of studies that girls are very interested in 
programming and STEM education if you have the social component mm -hmm. included. And so we have developed programs like Made with Code, where you actually have exactly this program for social components. So I think this is something we need to define more closely. So don't say we don't need <laughs> a lot of um, um, programmers, because I think we actually do. But I think we need to define programming much more broadly. And I fully agree, programming is not this very uninspirational, just sitting in a dark room and typing some code, but it's a very so social uh, way of interacting because you're right, you have to think about if you code a certain line, what might be the consequences on society. So all these interactions are very important. I, I, I think the important thing is that we cannot any longer afford to have students with diverse modalities of thinking. Uh -huh. um, students who are technical students and students who are humanities and social sciences students. We need technical people who have the capacity to think critically about the um, uh, uh, social and ethical assumptions of the work that they're doing. And similarly, we need people in the humanities and social sciences who can do computational thinking even if they can't code. You know, um, a community like this is a really um, interesting case study. You hear all of this sort of bizarre stuff in talks uh -huh. about our brains and why our brains are so important and how we have to put our brains in the cloud and all the uh -huh. rest of it that makes sort of really bizarre assumptions in the philosophy of mind and in ethics and uh -huh. without people having the critical kit to begin to unpick that. Well, in the same way you go to humanities and social sciences conferences uh -huh and you hear people talking about dystopian technological futures without any understanding about what technology may or may not do. We just can't afford as a community anymore to do that CP snow thing. Time's flying by, so really quick uh, answer with Martin and follow up with Thibaut. Oh, we just invented a new form of programming. It's called social coding. Oh, oh. exactly. That, that, yeah. Let's do this uh, special project uh, after the panel, social coding. Uh, Thibault, I'm really interested in the fact that um, actually education has been for so long um, a political matter. Is actually meeting this challenge of leaving no one behind for the skills of the future still a political matter? Well, I think education has always been a, a, a political matter, of course. Uh, the, the idea behind uh, this movement and these initiatives that we have to, to raise the level of, uh, of literacy, of, mm -hmm. of the skills, of the knowledge, which is, a, which is a good objective, I think. And no matter how politicians behave or what are the other byproducts of a, of a political initiative, education itself is a, is a very political thing. And it, it helped human history to come out from, from the situation where literacy was a profession. It made literacy a horizontal skill. And I think we're just repeating now with coding, uh, the, the whole development. Coding now, it's a profession. But if education does it well, education can be, um, sorry, coding can be uh, a horizontal skill in the future. And that's the role of education and the politics behind the education to help this development. Okay, let me, through, let me go through a list of um, these critical skills needed for the future indeed. The study has been uh, edited by uh, Wedgepoint, and the skills they are listing are critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, digital literacy, and entrepreneurism. Would you agree with this list? And there is actually a point we haven't been tackling so far with entrepreneurism, that the fact that we need entrepreneurial skills. And when we're, I mean, discussing with Tibor, the fact that maybe we're just thinking about jobs as position right now, but maybe in the near future, it would be just tasks more than actual factual positions. Yeah, Tibor, maybe well, first. For me, to be an entrepreneur doesn't mean to be exclusively an economic animal but it's to be entrepreneur is a is a personality who is able to pursue his or her own autonomous life both economically and socially mm -hmm. it means responsibility it means uh, 
determination, uh, efficiency, and, uh, and the whole complexity of a, of a personality. That, that's the entrepreneurship for me. That would be the first skill you would list or you would add on your short list <laughs> for uh, the skill of the future? Entrepreneurship is definitely one of, one of the essential elements uh -huh. of my... So there's, a, so there's a tension in this yeah. conversation, right? <laughs> um, a, an Aus a Australian university recently polled their undergraduates and 75% of them said they want to be entrepreneurs, by which if essentially they meant they want to work for themselves and not have anybody tell them what to do. And yet we've talked about collaboration, uh -huh. working in teams, exactly. being a part of... And there is a tension in the culture at the moment between this vision of the future of us all being lone hero individuals who go out and do our own thing um, in the kind of fragmentation of traditional work understandings and also an emphasis, a, a realization that actually it's only together that we're going to achieve things um, and actually institutions may become more important rather than less important. So I think entrepreneurship is important as a mindset for our students uh -huh. and to encourage them to take risks and to be creative, but so too is teaching them how to work in a group as a part of a team and as a part of an organization. And those two things are often in tension with one another. Martin, would you agree? So entrepreneurship is very important, but I think real entrepreneurs are like artists. They are born with it, they run with it. The rest of us, you know, we try. Uh, and it's good to try to teach it and to give the skill set and so on. But um, yeah, the real artists, are born as such. I would add one thing to the yeah. list, which is very hard to teach. It's originality. Hmm. Or singularity. Maybe. <laughs> Sabine. Uh, I would also agree with the list. Actually, we did a study and had the same findings, so I couldn't agree more. I would also add one thing, which is innovation, uh, because I think we need innovation in the systems, because I agree the systems are and will be important, but we see um, at least most of the institutions um, evolving too slowly. So innovation and meaning that giving teachers more capacity to actually um, invent a bit more, to be entrepreneurial for themselves, to also give more um, power basically to the kids. I think this is very important and will help actually to build this sense of trust and uh, sense of also entrepreneurship in the mindset of the kids. So let's actually build together a program for social cutting and rock this future. And I guess you now know about the skills your children actually will need to know in the near future so that there won't be life behind this digital and economical society. Thank you so much.